they have several yeah. different names, x intercepts, we can call them roots, solutions, zeros, x intercepts. Anytime you hear any of those terms, you should think the same thing. Um, now, zeros, that term should be familiar because that's the button that you press on the calculator to find it if you're looking at the graph. Um, but sometimes they're also called roots, they're called solutions because it's, if it's an equation set equal to zero, it's the solution to the equation. But first of all, I want you to answer what is true about the equation of any function when it crosses the x-axis. There's a characteristic that's true about any function. When you cross the x-axis, what's true? Any point on the x-axis has something in common. What is that? Y is zero. Okay, y is zero. <clears throat> so, in order to find the x-intercept of any function, you should set the function equal to zero. And solve for x. Now, it's a very simple concept. It's true for any function. It's just what's going to be different is depending on the function will dictate how we solve for it. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to look at are our polynomials, just like we, just like we did with domain and range. We're going to talk about polynomials. Now, for polynomials, you probably know this, it may, may or may not have been formalized for you in the past, but your maximum number of x-intercepts is equal to the degree. Now that's just your maximum number. It's not guaranteed, but it's the maximum number you will find. Um, so if you have a quadratic, okay, you know that quadratic functions, parabolas, um, have a maximum number of two x-intercepts. Now sometimes we only have one, sometimes we don't have any. It just depends on the type of quadratic. Uh, if you have a cubic function, you could have up to three x-intercepts. Now, most of the time you only have one, but you could have a potential of three. Um, if it's x to the fifth, it could cross five times. Okay, it could cross five times. So, um, to find these x-intercepts, if possible, you want to factor. Um, if you can't factor it, then you just want to use your calculator to find them. So let's look at number five. To begin with, we have x to the fourth plus x cubed minus 3x squared plus 3. This is a fourth degree polynomial, so the number of possible x-intercepts is 4. Now, if we were to attempt to factor this, what type of factoring would we attempt to do? Grouping. Yes, because it is a four-term polynomial. That's your only option when you have four terms, is to factor by grouping. Um, now, we could start it. It never hurts to attempt to factor it by grouping. So, for the first two terms, I would take out an x cubed. And that would leave me with uh, x plus 1. For the second two terms, I would take out a negative 3. And that leaves me with x squared minus 1. Now, see if you can hang with me here. We didn't actually, because <clears throat> obviously at this point, it's not the grouping that we're used to, right? Because we don't have the exact same linear term there. But... I'm seeing a little bit of a similarity here, right? Because x squared minus 1, can't we factor that further? Yeah, we can factor. It's the difference of perfect squares. So I'm going to keep the first thing. Okay, I'm going to keep that the same. Um, I'm going to break down x squared minus 1 into x plus 1 times x minus 1. Now they do have something in common. Okay, they have x plus 1 in common. Um, so the way that I'm going to look at this is not really typically the way that we did grouping. Um, but the reason why grouping works the way that it does is because you have a common factor between these two terms. 
So what grouping does is it takes that common factor out. It factors it out like a GCF, and you put what you've got left in your parentheses. So from the first term, we have x cubed left. From the second term, we have 3 times x minus 1 left. Um, and I'm just going to kind of combine like terms there. Well, actually not combine like terms. I'm going to distribute the negative 3 <coughs> inside the parentheses. So what I have is I can find one x-intercept. I can set x plus 1 equal to 0. And I can find that it has um, an x-intercept of negative 1. Now, x cubed minus 3, x plus 3, kind of out of luck there. I can't really do anything else with that. I can't factor it because it's a cubic um, function. Not really anything else I can do there. So for my potential other two x-intercepts, I'm going to have to rely on my calculator. Um, so really, I'm bless you. I could do this one of two ways. Okay, I could do this one of two ways. I could go back and plug in the original function. Okay, I can graph the original function and then just find what the other x-intercepts other than negative 1, because they're already found negative 1, I can uh, look for the other ones. Or, technically what I've done is I've reduced my function. I can graph this function and it will give me the other x-intercepts as well. So I'm going to show you both ways. Um, going back to the original, because I understand, I, I've never shown you this type of factoring before, I just wanted to point it out, um, kind of extend the factoring by grouping idea, take you to a higher level for y'all who are smart on it, free calculus students, right? Going back to the original, going to graph that and look for its x-intercepts, potential of 4, We'll see how many there actually are. There are only actually two. Okay. Here's the one that we found, negative one. We found that by uh, factoring. Okay, but let's look for the other one there. Uh, using the um, functions on our calculator, it looks like it's about negative two, but it's not at exactly negative two. We're looking for the zero, because it's where the function equals zero. So I want to it asks for a left bound. It wants my cursor on the left side of that zero. Now, um, it looks like I'm kind of close right here uh, to not being on the right side, but I know that I am because look at my y value. It's positive. Okay? I got to have um, a positive y value on one side and a negative on the other side. Um, so, I'm going to calculate my zero now. <clears throat> now notice that the calculator gives me kind of a weird answer. We're really only concerned about the x part, but if you glance at the y part, it doesn't say that it's equal to zero. Remember, that's scientific notation. Anytime that capital E comes up, that's the calculator's way of telling you that it's scientific notation. That's negative 1 times 10 to the negative 12. Negative 12 moves us 12 decimal places to the left. That's a super, super, super small number which is essentially zero. It's just the calculator, a little bit of a shortcoming there. Um, anyways, long story short, our other zero or x-intercept is approximately negative 2.104. Let's round to three numbers after the decimal. Now, I did mention that I could have also graphed my reduced form. So I'm going to do that right now and show you how it has the same x-intercept. Okay, so this is the reduced, this is the other piece of the um, function there. And if I find its zero, notice it only has one x-intercept. And it is the, the exact same value as the original. Okay, and this time it actually did give me zero as the y value. Not sure why it didn't on the other one, but it didn't. <clears throat> um, so I just wanted to show you how these functions are related to each other. Okay, and how it gives me the same thing. This one only has one x-intercept. 
The other one only had two. Um, I want to mention this. Remember how we're supposed to write our x-intercepts? We don't just write them as x equals. We are supposed to write them as points. So you need to write that as negative 1, 0 and negative 2.104, These are the actual answers that I want there for the x-intercepts. <clears throat> and yes, I know that, that can be a little uh, confusing when we're using the interval notation, but as long as you label everything, you should know these are points. If it's going to be in range, those parentheses are indicating an interval, not uh, points. So, those are x-intercepts for polynomials. Let's talk about the y-intercepts. Okay, so what's true about the equation of any function when you cross the y-axis? x is 0. It's the opposite relationship. When you're on the y-axis, your x-coordinate is 0. So y-intercepts are easier. That's why I did this second. Um, to find the y-intercept of the function, you should plug in 0 for x. And with polynomial functions, y-intercepts are really, really easy because they're just that constant on the end. Because if you plug in 0 for all these other numbers, 0 to the 4th, 0 cubed, 0 squared, all those results are 0, so the only thing that survives, so to speak, when you plug in 0, is that constant on the end. So our y-intercept for this polynomial function, which is number 5, and use the exact same one here, is the point 0, 3. x is 0, the y is 3. Okay, now when we talk about some of the other functions, <clears throat> it's not quite as clear cut as just the constant number on the end, but this does make it easy. Now, if there is not a constant on the end, then it would be zero, but I think all of these have constants on the end. <clears throat>